Welcome everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure for the School of Public Policy to have Randall Holcomb uh, as a guest speaker today. This lecture has been made possible by the generosity of the Cobb Charitable Foundation. Uh, Dr. Randall Holcomb is a Debo Moore Professor of Economics at Florida State University. His primary areas of research are public finance and the economic analysis of public policy issues. He is currently an editorial board member of several academic journals as, such as the Public Choice, the Quarterly Journal of Ocean Economics, and the Independent Review. Dr. Holcomb is also Senior Fellow at the James Madison Institute, which is a think tank that is specialized in issues related to state government. He also served on Florida Governor Jeb Bush Council of Economic Advisors from 2000 to 2006. Dr. Holcomb is the author of 12 books and more than 100 articles published in academic and professional journals. His books include The Economic Foundations of Government, Public Policy and the Quality of Life, From Liberty to Democracy, The Transformation of American Government, and Entrepreneurship and Economic Progress. Recently, he edited a book with the title Housing America, so here is the book, uh, it just came up uh, this year. Uh, information about this book will be provided on your way out. Uh, this was published by the Independent Review. And uh, today we are delighted to listen to uh, Dr. Holcomb's lecture, which will focus on discussing the impact of the stimulus programs pursued by the Bush and the Obama administration during the financial crisis. This discussion is of extreme importance as the economy must live with the consequences of these programs and policymakers must evaluate these effects in order to draw an adequate plan of action. Please join me to welcome Dr. Holcomb. Thanks very much for that uh, introduction, Lisa. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the impact of the Bush and Obama stimulus programs on the future of American capitalism. Uh, and in order to, to start out give you some background on that, first thing I want to talk about is the nature of American capitalism, uh, how it produces great prosperity that we have. Uh, and uh, what underlies uh, the, the foundations of American capitalism and how those foundations are threatened by some of the policies we've seen over the past year and a half. To start out, let me tell you how I got here. This is, a, this is an amazing, this is just something amazing I'm going I'm to tell you. Um, I live in Florida. And what I did was I got, I climbed into an aluminum cylinder. <laughs> and I traveled at 550 miles an hour, six miles above the surface of the earth, to arrive here in California from Florida in a matter of a few hours. Now, let me tell you the really amazing thing about this story. None of you are amazed that I could do this. That's the amazing thing. You're saying, well, of course you took the airlines. The fact, we just take it for granted that you can hop in an airplane and go coast to coast in, in a matter of a few hours. You know, a hundred years ago, nobody could have done this. Yesterday, I spent part of the day in Florida, part of the day in California. A hundred years ago, nobody could say that they did that. It would have been impossible to do it. You look at the remarkable economic progress that we have these days, and we tend to take for granted. Uh, 20 years ago, almost nobody had cell phones. Now, I, just, I tend to take a little poll in my classes sometimes and ask, how many people don't have a cell phone? Only Dr. Batchelder back here in the back <laughs> can raise his hand and say that he doesn't have a cell phone. By the way, uh, Dr. Batchelder and I uh, uh, were colleagues.
colleagues from several decades back, and he picked me up at the airport, and it's so great to see him, so I'm, I'm delighted to see you here. <coughs> so, you know, when you think about, uh, about the remarkable economic progress that we have, the standard of living that we have, driving around in our automobiles, flying around, taking the airlines, the cell phones, the iPods, the internet, um, I mean, the World Wide Web only got started in the early 1990s. Uh, and, you know, one of my kids, now 16 years old, told me one time, he says, Dad, he says, I just cannot imagine what life would be like without the Internet. <laughs> okay, so you look at this, this remarkable economic progress that we just take for granted. How long has this been going on? Only about 250 years. If you go back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, about 1750 or so. That's when this remarkable economic progress started. And when you look at the standard of living of people back then, when you look at the, at the lifestyle that they had, the, the food that they ate, the way that they produced it, the, the goods that they consumed, well, their, their economic progress was so slow, people would not have noticed it in their lifetimes. That life in 1750 wasn't that different from life in 1650. Life in 1650 wasn't that different from life in 1550. Life in 1550 wasn't that different from life in 550. You've got a thousand years there where, you know, uh, you, you look at the, the remarkable advances in civilization. It's not that there was no economic progress. You, you look at uh, ancient Rome, you look at China, at the advances that they had in their civilizations. But... Um, by about 550 A.D., that economic progress essentially slowed to a crawl, you know, virtually stopped, so that somebody who uh, managed a long nap, you know, who uh, went to sleep in 550 and woke up in 1550, wouldn't see that much difference, you know, in, in people's lifestyles, in how they lived, in the goods they consumed, in the way they produced those goods. And then after the Industrial Revolution, this remarkable economic progress began, and it's still going on today. The foundation of this economic progress is the role that profits and losses play in a market economy. Profits give people an incentive to look for ways to be productive to help out other people. Uh, uh, so entrepreneurs, innovators, look for innovations that they can introduce into the economy. Uh, and, uh, and, and profits play several closely related roles in, in an economy. If you, if you stop to think about it now, if, if we're thinking about our economic well-being, if somebody takes resources and combines those resources into output, and the value of the output is greater than the value of the resources used to produce the input, uh, 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 used to purchase the inputs. That's a good thing for all of us, right? It increases value in the economy. We should reward people who take less valuable inputs and turn them into more valuable outputs. And in fact, the market economy does that. That's the role of profit. And if somebody takes resources, that have a certain value, they combine them into output that's worth less than the value of the resources that they started with, they're reducing value in the economy. We should penalize people who do that. And in fact, the market economy does. That's the role of losses in an economy. Profits reward people who allocate resources efficiently. Losses penalize people who allocate resources inefficiently. And those, those profits and losses also provide incentives in an economy. For entrepreneurial individuals who are looking for innovations, if they can come up with innovations to increase value in an economy, that profit acts as a lure to give innovators an incentive to be innovative, to be entrepreneurial. Uh, but on the other side of that, uh, what, at the same time that profits give an incentive for people to take risks, possibility of losses also gives them an incentive to be prudent in the risks that they take so they don't take excessive risks.